So welcome again. <clears throat> you remember we were just discussing uh, the idea whether romantic love is a historical development, is, is dependent on particular historical um, uh, developments uh, in the West. Uh, and we had this idea of uh, Beigel, let's briefly um, repeat this, that the romantic love uh, should be considered a cultural phenomenon evolved from basic human feelings uh, because the development of society was frustrating emotionally. Uh, it led to people losing ties to family and the security of a more uh, ordered um, society of the Middle Ages. And therefore, in order to make up for the heartless, heartlessness and coldness of this um, industrialization, uh, urbanization in the 19th century, people uh, developed love as an emotional counterweight to that. Now, similarly, um, uh, we have another approach to, to the same kind of argument um, from Lindholm, who is an anthropologist and wrote about anthropology. Um, and anthropology is the study of human beings um, in their cultural contexts. So it's a study of, of cultures, you could say, uh, human cultures and human behavior in different cultures. So now this is more a comparative kind of uh, discipline. So instead of looking at the history of one culture, like we saw before in the Bible reading, so now here we have a comparisons of different cultures and what we can learn from them. So two different approaches. Uh, he explains, you know, the difference between anthropology and sociobiology. Sociobiology is what we will see next. The next reading we will talk about is a biological reading. So anthropological students of emotion are interested in discovering when and where romantic love occurs, he says, and in correlating its emergence with particular social and psychological preconditions. This is Lindholm. A romantic love and anthropology is the reading. Um, the citation is down there. <coughs> the, the reference is down there. This is from 2006. Um, so a much more modern uh, reading than the previous one, which was from the 50s. Um, let's uh, see uh, what he says. Those influenced by social biology, this is now the opposite uh, point, in contrast, believe love must necessarily appear in all human societies since it is genetically ingrained. So he creates this dichotomy, this contradiction between these two, uh, this is opposition, you would better say, between these two positions. Um, so the anthropologists would look when and where romantic love occurs and what are the historical, uh, social, psychological preconditions, while the biologist would look at the genetics of love and the genetical advantage from love and the evolutionary advantage from love. And so these are two positions. And obviously, Lindholm, as an anthropologist, is in the first camp. So the question is, is romantic love a cultural practice dependent on society, or is it a biological phenomenon that appears in all societies in the same way? And, and Lindholm's answer is that it is the first. Like previously, we, we stay in the same camp, essentially, right? like we had before. One reason to assume that cultural practices determine our understanding of romantic love is that in other cultures, love and marriage don't always go together, he says. Right? This is one of the important points, because if it was biologically determined, then we would have no choice. We would have the same kind of love, or the same kinds of marriage, because this is what we biologically do. In the same way, like, like lions, for example, or uh, frogs uh, have the same mating patterns wherever they live. You know, lions in one place in Africa and lions in another place in Africa, although they have never met, follow the same patterns of mating, the same with mosquitoes in Greece and mosquitoes in China. These things all work the same because they are biologically determined. But... For us, this is not necessarily the case. Um, we can look at other cultures and we can find that their ideas of love and marriage are different from ours. Uh, we, for example, see a strong connection between love and marriage. Other cultures don't. And we have already seen historically, uh, cult even our culture in the past did not have this connection. So, for example, for Socrates, there was no 
uh, idea that that you have to marry the one you love. Aristotle never wanted to marry Alcibiades or anything. Uh, Aristotle was married with his wife uh, happily or or less. Uh, it's unclear in this case. Um, but anyway, he did not. Uh, nobody in the symposium wanted to marry each other, right? They they all had women and wives, and the marriage was just separate. Uh, also, of course, in our courtly love, right? The whole point was to separate the marriage from the romance. Uh, so even in our culture, not only in other cultures, these things don't always go together. Of course, as an argument now, this is not necessarily the full point. Because whether love and marriage goes together is one point, but whether all cultures have romantic love is another point. So there could be a different expression. It could be that some cultures connected with marriage, some cultures don't connect it with marriage, but all cultures have romantic love. And indeed, you know, you could say the love of Alcibiades to Socrates is similar in a way to the love of Abela to Eloise, uh, which is similar to the love of. Um, uh, Jack and Rose in Titanic, right? In a way, these kinds of love are all similarly romantic. Uh, they have similar properties, like romantic, the, the properties of romantic love, the, the desire to be with the other person, the desire for union, the um, symmetry of desire, and so on. And and this, are the, this is the important thing. And whether they actually marriage or not uh, is, is part of that is not so important, right? So, uh, strictly speaking, as, as an argument uh, to show that love and marriage uh, don't go together sometimes, it does not fully prove the point that love is a cultural practice that, that is different from society to society, right? So keep this in mind. It's not a very good argument. In fact, in most of the complex societies for which we have records, he says, of romantic passion, um, love between husband and wife was considered both absurd and impossible, and we have seen this also in ancient Greece. So why would this be? Can you think about it for a moment? Why would many societies uh, not see marriage as a good um, infrastructure in which to practice love? Obviously, membership in one's father's clan determines claims to property, leadership, or honor in societies that have a patriarchal structure. And how do you get into the clan of the father? Um, you, by birth or by marriage, right? So marriage creates connections to other clans and their respective claims. Um, property gets inherited and and property gets inherited uh, in patriarchal societies, you know, to the son. But when the son marries, then the wife also uh, takes part in this uh, scheme of inheritance. And then the child of this couple also becomes an heir to this property. Uh, so there you have then different clans which uh, own each other's properties, right? And and so this is something that needs to be planned, that is a power play, and that has nothing to do with tender feelings, right? So in this context, um, marriage was too important a matter to be decided by young people swept away by passion. Rather, marriage arrangements were negotiated by powerful elders whose job was to advance the interests of the clan, much as royal marriage are still arranged today, okay? So the idea is that, that you have two different games. One is the game of power and possessions, and one is the game of love. And there is no good reason why these two should uh, be played by the same players, right? Um, and so because love with one's spouse was next to impossible, because one's spouse was selected by strangers, she, she or he was a stranger uh, themselves, and therefore, romantic feelings were directed instead towards individuals one could not marry, right? So that we separate these concerns and the passion does not interfere with the power play of marriage. But this then, of course, can cause problems because humans are not machines and it's difficult to separate your emotions from uh, the people you're living with every day, right? So if you live in a household with a person, and you have feelings towards another person, this naturally creates a tension, right? So in Japan, 
in the uh, 1600s to 1800s. Uh, this is, you remember, the, the point of taking some old uh, example because if you take Japan today, Japan today is mostly influenced by the West, right? And so you need to find some traditional example where this was not yet the case. Love dramas always revolved around the conflicts caused by relationships between respectable men and their courtesans. So you have these people going to a um, uh, you know, commercial kind of love experience and um, then you have respectable men, but obviously these um, people providing the love services were not as respectable. And then you have the men getting involved emotionally and then not being able to separate their emotions from their uh, proper lives uh, inside the family and society. And this causes then these conflicts. Or in ancient Rome, powerful men would fall in love with their slaves. Also a problem, right? Because the slave is not supposed to have this power over his owner, but emo strong emotions give you a power, right? If, if, you, if you are the slave and your owner is in love with you, then this emotional um, need of the owner to connect with you gives you a power as a slave over your owner. And this totally upsets the social uh, conventions about how power should be in the society. So Roman poets idealized their beloved slave prostitutes as domina, literary, literary, literally reversing the role of master and slave. Um, so domina comes from domus, the house, right? So it means the owner of the house. So although this is not the woman of your house, uh, she is a... Uh, slave prostitute, but if you are, if your feelings are too much involved with a slave prostitute, then she eventually becomes somebody who can order you to do things, uh, and she she gains an influence upon your house and reverses the role of master and slave, so she becomes the master, right? And in order to avoid such problems, many societies explicitly stress the chastity of romantic relationships. So then you can you can avoid this by saying, okay, even in a romantic relationship, you are not supposed to have sex because the sexual union is too powerful and will give too much power to your sexual partner. Therefore, the sex has to be in marriage, but the feelings can be outside, right? Uh, of course, this, this then is a very artificial kind of distinction. Um, and it doesn't always go well, like in the Middle Ages. It didn't go well for Abelard. It didn't go well for Tristan. Um, uh, and is old, right? So their stories show that you you can try to have this ideal of separating sex and love, uh, but it is not clear that this actually uh, will work out well. Um, and um, he cites uh, a tribe of people living in Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan, uh, mountain people, and they inhabit a harsh, isolated, and unforgiving world. They are very individualistic, self-interested, competitive, and they expect manipulation and opportunism from all social interactions. So if you if you are a Star Trek fan, uh, this reminded me very much of the Ferengi, right? So the, uh, this seems to be the kind of, of mental state these people have. Uh, their personal lives are dominated by fear, mistrust, hostility, secrecy, and social masking are at a premium while collective action and cooperation are minimal, right? So this is is a society that uh, that is that doesn't seem to be very friendly as a society. But then inside the society, romantic relationships are idealized. A love affair implies absolute trust, mutuality, and loyalty. Such a love is to be pursued at all costs. Romance is both the stuff of dreams and of life. Frustrated lovers among the merry may commit suicide and become celebrated in the romantic poems and songs that are the mainstay of their art. So this now is a, you could say is a real world, second example to what we had before uh, with Beigel's thesis that love is a counterweight to the coldness of the industrial age. And so in this case, you have a non-industrial society, but still a cold society because of their 
values which are so individualistic and opportunistic and and then you have again the counterweight of this extreme romantic love so this is supposed to make the same point right it's supporting the same idea love is a compensation romantic love is a compensation for whatever else is wrong in your society and then romance is absolutely opposed to marriage which is never for love so marriage is a tool for power and uh, gaining possessions um, and romantic love is secret and dangerous and it is also non-sexual so they try to make these uh, distinctions so he again he makes the same point in rigid antagonistic and complex society courtly ancient roman old japanese or we could add you know like Beigel, even 19th centuries industri industrialized society the ad idealization offered by romantic love offers a way of imagining a different and more fulfilling life but because of the objective reality of the social environment, romance can never form the base for actually constructing the family. So it must instead stand against and outside of the central social formation. In societies with more fluid social relations that are individualistic and operating in insecure environments, people may find meaning and emotional warmth in the, warmth in the mutuality of romantic relationships. Romance in these societies is associated with marriage, so the society is still cold um, and uh, still individualistic and insecure. So people are seeking this emotional um, warmth of a love relationship. But now because the society is more fluid, it does not distinguish between marriage and love in such a strict way. Instead, romance can be associated with marriage. And this describes our society, right? Since the couple is idealized as the ultimate refuge against a hostile world and functions as the necessary nucleus of the atomized social organization. So this describes our present situation, right? We have a society that is uh, unforgiving, cold, uh, unrelatable, uh, and we have our core family which integrates both sex and love in this idealized version of marriage. Okay, so yeah, so here we have two readings that uh, support the same point. Uh, one a little older with more historical examples, one newer with examples from anthropology. Um, about the idea that love is actually um, a historical development, a reaction to a bad, unforgiving, cold society. And now in the next um, part of this, we will go into the thesis that romantic love is universal. So let's break it here again, and um, I'll see you in the next video.